Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. This episode is sponsored by A. Stotts Academy's online course, How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market. I wrote this course for those who want to go from feeling frustrated, intimidated, or even overwhelmed by the stock market to become confident and in control of their financial future. Go to myworstinvestmentever.com slash deals to claim your discount now. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts, and I'm here with featured guest, James Leung. James, are you ready to rock? Absolutely, Andrew. <clears throat> I'm excited to introduce you to the audience. And for those listening, um, you know, I've just got to know James briefly, and he was recommended by one of my prior guests, Avi. And I really am excited to, to bring you on the show because you and I have a similar vision, a similar, we take pleasure in the similar thing. So listen up audience, James Leung is the founder of Visions One Consulting, a training consultancy that teaches finance to non-financial people. Using his unique financial storytelling approach, James is able to simplify a complex and dry topic to make learning joyful and fun. <laughs> James has helped thousands of university students and non-financially trained people grasp finance and accounting easily, empowering them to make better decisions. I love that because that's the whole point of learning finance is to make better decisions. The Singapore Business Review has featured James as one of 10 influential professional speakers in Singapore. James is also a, also a certified speaking professional, a recognition earned by the top 12% of professional speakers worldwide. James, can you take a minute and fill in further tidbits about your life? Sure. Thank you, Andrew. So. Well, I started with uh, accountancy, really. Went to School of Accountancy, uh, worked with a big four audit firm, well, worked with finance teams. And uh, over time, I realized something. I have um, worked in accounting. I have done consulting. But the thing that gives me the greatest happiness is actually teaching. And so I trained my team a lot when I was in the finance department, upskilling them. And when the opportunity come along, I decided to start on my own and embark, embark on my own entrepreneurial journey. And I decided that uh, what I want to be doing for literally the rest of my life is to be able to help people learn uh, finance in an easy way. So leveraging on my knowledge and my experience, uh, plus my passion in teaching and sharing. So a little bit of a tidbit in uh, what I do other than in accountancy, I'm also a Toastmasters. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, that helped a lot in terms of helping me to be able to communicate my ideas uh, more skillfully and also to be able to impart ideas across clearly to help as many people as I can to understand a very difficult subject. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> for the listeners out there, I think there's some really great takeaways just right from that. And that is the first thing is that uh, when James said, you know, he said it offline when we first talked and I could just see the sunshine coming from it. And when he said it now, it's just that it's just like he's found the woman of his dreams uh, in the sense that he said, you know, that he just has this passion for teaching finance and it makes him happy and he wants to do that the rest of his life. And I want to challenge the listeners out there. I want to challenge everybody to take a lesson from James. You know, I mean, <clears throat> it's a lesson I took a long time ago also, which is Find what really turns you on. And I, I want to tell a quick story. <clears throat> My sister is a great artist and she uh, can paint, you know, and I can't paint at all. And James, I was visiting her in Maine. She lives in Kennebunk, Maine. And we went to a, a coffee shop and she said, you see that picture over on the wall there? And I said, yeah, it's beautiful. And she said, I, 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 I painted that. I was like, wow, how did it get here? <laughs> how did it get here? She said, I painted it and I put it up for sale and this coffee shop bought it. I was like, my God, you could do that. Why don't you do that for a living? My sister's a mortgage broker. I said, why don't you do that for a living? You know, like you could go into your basement, paint a couple paintings. You know, how long does it take to paint a great painting like that? It doesn't take her that long. You could sell them and keep getting better at painting and better at selling them. You should do that. And you know what she said to me? She said, I don't like painting. Mm. <laughs> 
it blew my mind and it got me thinking about you know the difference between the things that we like and the things that we're good at and yes it would be great if the things that we're good at is what we like but the truth is my sister loves helping people she loves to be on the phone she loves to be bringing value to people as a mortgage broker helping them to find the right mortgage that fits their situation and that's the that's the reason why she doesn't paint and so I just want to, you know, use you as a great example for the audience, as someone who really has, you know, said, I found my passion and I'm pursuing it with vigor. Yeah. And to add on to that, uh, one of the mantra that I have lived by for the past uh, 30 years is Confucius said, if you do what you love, then you never have to work another day. So I believe that to be true. So I resonate a lot with that. That's kind of how I felt my life has been. So when I show up for work and there is training to be in front of people, is very much was looking towards something very, very joyful. And so I bring joy to the process and I enjoy the process in return. So definitely go seek your passion. I think that is what gives uh, joy and happiness in life, which is ultimately the most important thing. You're a great power of example for all of us on that. So I appreciate it. So now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances surrounding that and then tell us your story. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, when uh, my good friend, our good friend, Avi introduced uh, you to me, I was happily saying, yeah, sure. You know, again, coming from a space of just being uh, giving and okay, Andrew says, I need a podcast uh, guest. I said, Why not? Right? So I said, yes, very quickly. And then when I check what you want to talk about, oops, <laughs> jitters, I mean, brought back the goosebumps, <laughs> but I unroll back. I'm going to talk about my worst investment ever. Uh, so I make a lot of mistakes along the way. I don't think this is probably like the, the last one I'm going to make, but it was, I would say, one of the first ones that I made, mm. uh, which is why I remember it so well. So it's, I started off, uh, it was like fresh from school, right? So I'm um, with knowledge in finance and accounting. So I thought I understood like, numbers. So there's this particular company. It was uh, listed on a stock exchange for a young uh, startup. Uh, it was uh, just a newly IPO company. A lot of hype around it, tremendous growth prospects. Uh, not a day could or week could go by without somebody saying something great about this company. And of course, the share price goes up, and that's what attracted your all my attention, right? And so the numbers look good, and so therefore I invested. Kind of my first investment, first relatively substantial investment, right? From hey, and now guess what? So IPO year was ah. Uh -huh the best year ever, right? <laughs> <laughs> you look at the prospectus, everything leading up to the IPO year was perfect condition. So you this a J-shaped growth curve, sales, revenue, everything was going. And then just after they go IPO, things start to dip. <laughs> and so this is where the first sort of trouble begin. But that's the problem. In those days, these were pre-internet days. So there were no quarterly reports. You can't go in Google and first find out what, uh, what people, what analysts are saying, what you, right? A great analyst like Andrew mm. could be saying about the company, or I couldn't get like last five, 10 years of data for free on the internet. Anything I get, I get, I get it through the published payroll report. And that's like six months after the financial year. And so that's kind of always behind it, the fact. And the thing that you can get ahead of the numbers are really news. So while the numbers are not looking so good after a year, people are, you know, analysts were still talking about, oh, the company's going to turn around and we have great investors coming in in the form of royalty, right? So <laughs> this boosted confidence. And so you think about um, Warren Buffett, you know, I'm a buy and hold investor, right? So <laughs> concentrated portfolio, right? And uh, so, so we held on to the portfolio and the next year, the number got worse. <laughs> <laughs> and now this is where the problem is. So uh, when you get so fixated on a story that you ignore the numbers. Yep. And uh, so you know, when, and beyond a certain point, it becomes painful to cut loss. Mm. And that's when you hold on to a hope. So I think, uh, and, and eventually, eventually the company wound up, right? So, and it was like, hey, okay. So I kind of like so seeing the whole thing to, you know, in slow-mo and I was kind of still holding on to it. And it was absolutely disgusting, right? It was absolutely disgusting. And well, so, 
So it's really about what you know, what you learn versus what your reptilian brain tells you, the emotional brain versus the logical brain. So on the one hand, you know you should stop, stop, uh, you should stop the loss. But on the other hand, you are hopeful. You're still buying or latching on to an old story. So I think that is something, uh, a, a big powerful lesson that I learned. And So if, let me ask you, um, so yeah. in the end, did you ride it all the way down until it, you lost everything or did you sell it at, you know, 90% uh, down or how did it go? Yeah, it was like that. You can, okay, it's time to cut and before yeah. poof, the thing goes on, right? And uh, just out of curiosity, I, I, didn't get, I didn't receive the share certificate. I, I received some cash back. <laughs> <laughs> and you went and bought a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Coffee money. Coffee Something money. like that. And uh, yeah. let me ask you a question. Uh, can you remember the point where you felt the most kind of, I don't know, embarrassed or kind of ashamed or, you know, was there a time that you just thought I really messed up and, you know, I, I can you think of a day? Can you think of a time when you were there? Well, I think the point has been denier is that you're looking at the numbers. You look at the numbers are very clear, but then inside your mind, there's a story that tells you otherwise because somebody else is telling you the story. In those days, it was just print copy media, right? And it's whatever messages that are putting out there and you want to choose to believe the story rather than the numbers. I think big mistake, big mistake. Right? Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah. So let's uh, let's go through what lessons you learned. Let's summarize. You've already revealed some of them, but maybe you can yeah. summarize them. One, two, three. Yeah. So I think the, the most important thing here is uh, to be really objective about your investment. Uh, really trust the numbers. The numbers are there. Uh, I, I believe that today numbers are even more accessible than numbers in the past because we could get the latest information, we could get what the analysis say, so everything because it's internet ready, right? And the past year's data, five years, 10 years. So I think uh, that mistake could be easily avoided. That's number right, one because right. of the pure availability of data. That's number one. And uh, number two is to be able to uh, really know your numbers because the numbers speak truth. The numbers speak true, right? So, and uh, so do not let the numbers override the story. I mean, that's all I say, do not let the story override the numbers. Always back up the story with numbers. I think that's really, really important. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So mm. that's great coming from a numbers guy, you know, that we, you know, you have to balance, right? You know, there's a story, you know, you, you, you've got to believe in a story. If there's no story, you know, you does, the numbers don't matter. So you, the story is what hooks you into i know i'm talking as an analyst as an analyst yeah. writing research i didn't write research on companies if i didn't feel like there was a hook there was a story here this company is going to be uh scaling back this company's going to be expanding new products going to have a better higher margin we need that story to, to build our narrative of what we're investing in but then then you need the numbers also and if the, you got the story but you don't have the numbers then you may not have really a great investment idea exactly exactly <laughs> exactly um, so I want to just go through a couple of things that I take away from it. Um, the first thing I'm thinking about is you mentioned something about Buffett and concentrated portfolio. And this is for, you know, all the people out there who are saying, I want to start investing in the stock market. And, you know, I found this stock and it's really interesting. And I'm like Buffett. I, I believe in, you know, holding for a long time. Uh, I think what, what you need to understand, you know, for the audience, I want you to understand is that when, do, when, when Buffett talks about, you know, holding stocks for the long term, Actually, it's a little bit confusing. What he's really talking about is having exposure to the stock market for the long term. Really what he's talking about, because he's building a portfolio of 20 stocks or 10 stocks, and he wants to hold that individual stock for a lifetime, but he knows you can't do that. Eventually, you're going to sell one or the other. He's recently sold you know, a bunch of bank stocks and airline stocks and all that. So I think that the wisdom of his, his concept is the idea of, keeping your exposure in the market. Now, for some people, keeping their exposure in the market is just to you know, buy an ETF or an index fund. That may be the way to do it. But I think the other thing that I would highlight too from research that I've done and what I've learned over the years and what I've learned from guests is if you're going to own a stock, if you're going to buy stocks in the stock market, own 10, not one. No less than 10 because less than 10, you won't be fully diversifying. And by, if you buy more than 10, you might as well just buy an index fund. So if you want to be a stock picker, build a portfolio of 10 stocks. 
So that's the, other, the only other thing that I want to add is some research that I did a while ago where I looked at, I was in the Philippines and I was teaching about young people about how to start building their wealth, investing in the stock market. The book had just come out and I was teaching a class, I was teaching a group of 2,000 students in the Philippines. It was amazing. We had an amazing day, a lot of energy. But I had a problem in the Philippines because they didn't have ETFs that would allow them to own, for instance, every stock in the world. All you have is a Philippine market that they could invest in. Philippine market doesn't have that many companies in it, and most of these students did not know how to do financial analysis. So I, I decided I would play a little game myself after that, where I would, I would ask the question, I wonder if I went back 10 years ago and I said, every year I just randomly selected a portfolio of 10 stocks in the Philippines. What would have been the outcome? So I, I ran simulations of hundreds and hundreds of those to try to see where the outcomes were. You know, some of them did really well, some of them did really poorly. And I thought, well, it's not really good advice if I tell them just to randomly select stocks. It's good in the sense that they don't know how to pick stocks, but it's bad in the sense that some of those portfolios will crash. So then I said, okay, what if I overlay a stop loss onto that and say, if any of these stocks fall by 10, 15, 20%, I tested it at different thresholds, sell it. And what I found was that the downside was a lot less. The, down, the, the worst portfolios were considerably less. And the result of that is that I came up with this idea of just randomly selecting for those people where you don't have an index. Some markets, in, you don't have a good index. Randomly selecting but putting a stop loss on it can add a lot of value. And the, the takeaway from that little story is use a stop loss. A stop loss can help a person overcome the emotional pain of selling. And also, I would add, after many interviews, is that just sell half of your position. Just sell half. It, gives you, it gets you over the hump like to, to sell, and then reconsider the remaining. Any thoughts on those? I went on kind of long there, but those are two mm -hmm. things that I took away. Those are James, great advice, great advice, Andrew. And I'd like to add on a couple of things, uh, one of which is when Buffett says he's a buy and hold investor, uh, if you notice his portfolio, so he's really buying into well-established companies, company that has been around like Coca-Cola, right? For example, or Walmart, Costco. So he hardly ever goes into the IPO until recently when he bought into Snowflake. There's a, a pure, uh, there's a real departure from his established practice. So the speculation is that maybe his returns are the ones that make those decisions, but he buys into established company with good track record. So the story that I shared with you was an IPO company. So we need to be, it could be the, the Tesla, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something we need to uh, put on a different uh, set of lens and filter as we look at IPO companies versus established company. That's number one. Uh, Great number point. Two. Yeah, so, the, so these companies have a trend, right? That's a key idea versus a company that doesn't, doesn't have a trend. That's the first learning. And the second learning, uh, Buffett doesn't believe, believe in diversification, but then there's another disciple of Benjamin Graham, the, the teacher of Warren Buffett, and his name is Walter Sloss. And Walter Sloss said that my makeup, my psychological makeup is entirely, totally different from Buffett, even though they both studied under the same master. He said, I am a diversification guy. So he looks, uh, he, again, he's factor driven, he, is, he looks for undervalued stocks, but essentially he builds a portfolio of stocks, not concentrated bets. So I think we need to find out what's our psychological makeup, what is really, uh, what's important for us? What can we absorb? What could we take? How, how much volatility could we take in a portfolio? I think those are the things that matters as well. Great, great value. So let's now think about that young man or woman who's listening right now, who's found that really exciting story and they're ready to get into it and put their money in. They're ready to do it now. Based upon what you've learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend that person take to avoid suffering the same fate? Okay, so that's something I've already done, right? <laughs> because as part of my therapy, so I teach, I tell you, so I teach uh, finance, I make it simple, I teach people to read annual reports. They become one of my key case studies. <laughs> And so uh, what I teach in the class is that it becomes so obvious when you look at the numbers, all the signs are there. You look at the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow. You are able to assess the strength, performance, and health through all the financial ratios. 
it becomes crystal clear that the company is in trouble and continue to do so. So again, uh, so if I may, for a, a word of advice, is really go and study a course on how to read financial statements and reports. Could come to mine, come to yours. I think it doesn't matter, but the key idea here is perhaps the basics of reading financial statements. Great. And if they wanted to uh, learn more about your course, I'm going to put in a link to the to your website. So anybody who's interested, you can come to the the um, to the blog on this and to this episode, uh, and then you can look at the uh, the link, click on it, and go to the website. Is there any other way that people can reach out to you? Um, I'll we're sending a LinkedIn link as well. Yes. Yeah, that's a good, good way. Yeah. Okay, I'll have the LinkedIn link also to your to your LinkedIn, but then. If you just can't wait, just type in James Leung and you'll find him. So last question, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Number one goal in the next 12 months is to complete my book, right? So I've started on my book and it's going to be called, so I run a course essentially for, I call it finance, it belongs to a genre of finance for non-finance managers. So I teach this to corporate executives, I teach this to entrepreneurs, I teach it in a university. National University of Singapore to undergraduate and to empower them to be able to make better decisions using financial statements and annual reports, reading uh, financial ratios, right? And so what I've done over the years is that I've, I've come to a great discovery that people find uh, in general learning finance and accounting a, a real pain, right? So there's a lot of fears. So people have been telling me, James, you know, I, I wish I attended your course now uh, 10 years ago, but I thought you were it's so painful. And uh, I might fall asleep. I, I might get lost that I just held back for 10 years. And uh, when I come to your course, I realized I suffered for nothing because you're able to make something so, you're able to simplify everything. You make it so fun to be learning the topic. And I, I just realized that I'm able to learn this. So that's what I get a lot. And uh, really how I do it is through a way of simplifying, using a lot of visual storytelling and uh, relating the numbers to the story. So maybe I could show you a cool tool yeah. that I use. So this is uh, my invention. It's called accounting in a box. So literally in this box, it's a deck of 52 cards, which contains key and core financial concepts and principles that will allow anyone with no financial background to learn and grasp finance and accounting easily so that you can master and read a set of financial statements. Pretty that's easy. awesome. And that's such a great little tool, you know, like a handy, you know, something that you can, you know, flip through and, and grasp. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, let me just show you a couple of cards. That's kind of how they look like. Look at that. Oh. And then let's see one of them. Let's show, show one of them up to the- There you go. There it's all it about is. the balance sheet. Balance sheet. There you go. <laughs> Assets. Yep. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so, so when are we going to see the book come out? 2021. Fantastic. This year. Yeah. All right. Great. And uh, <clears throat> so listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember to go to myworstinvestmentever.com slash deals to claim your discount on how to start building your wealth, investing in the stock market of course. As we conclude, James, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Absolutely. Uh, keep learning. Learning never stops. Beautiful. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts, saying, I'll see you on the upside.